Today's presentation will be by Dr. Ken Miller, uh, a professor at uh, Rutgers in the Department of Earth and Planetary Sciences. Um, and he will be talking today about sea level change. So thank you, Ken, for joining us. And go ahead, the, it's all you now. Good morning. Thank you, Lauren. Uh, so today there's a topic that's in the news a lot. Every time you hear about climate change, you hear about the risks and impacts of sea level rise. And we're going to be looking at that today. On this figure here, uh, this is an update of a figure we produced a long time ago, back in the 90s, and did it for kind of fun. It shows what would happen if you melted all the ice sheets on Earth. Sea level would rise by about 66 meters, and this is what the Statue of Liberty and this cheekily stolen from uh, the Planet of the Apes movie of what it would look like. The actual photograph is from the Joides Resolution. You'll be hearing about the Joides Resolution, which is our scientific drill ship that uh, has yielded a lot of the data I'm going to talk about today. Uh, this was taken when Greg Mountain and I were co chiefs here off of New Jersey, and this is an actual photograph that we superimposed the Statue of Liberty on. So, about me, I'm a Jersey guy. I grew up in the town of Medford and went to Shawnee High School out in the Pinelands. I uh, went to uh, Rutgers for college and then on to the Woods Hole MIT joint program in oceanography. So my undergraduate degree is in geological sciences and my PhD is in oceanography. And I asked for a fun fact, and I think the most fun I ever had, and I'll show you a picture of it in a minute, is when I drove one mile, dove one mile deep into the oceans with a submersible Alvin off the coast of New Jersey. Uh, and just after I got back on deck, a captain came up and handed me a cigar and said, congratulations, uh, it's a boy. Uh, my son, second son was born right after I got off of the Alvin off of uh, New Jersey. He was on shore in New Jersey at the time. I've been a professor at Rutgers since 1988. I came there from Lamont. Ken, it's not um, advancing your slide. I don't know if you meant, it's still on the title slide. Oh. Uh, it's it's, a, it's advancing on my end. Yeah, you're lagging, Lauren. I don't know what's wrong with mine, so continue. <laughs> Sorry. Yeah, I've got a, I'm monitoring it on my own end. And I'm seeing. Okay. So I've been a Rutgers professor since 1988, and my research is on sea level and other major events in Earth history. One of my favorite things to talk about is the. The day the dinosaurs died, this is an illustration that my daughter Michelle has made for a book that, kids book that uh, Lauren and Michelle and I are working on. Uh, I teach marine geology this fall, I'll teach marine geology again, and in the spring I'll be teaching a signature course uh, called Sea Change, which some of these updated figures I'm going to show you today will certainly make it into that class. Everything's been refreshed and all new figures for this talk. I'm also I also teach a major course called sedimentary geology, and that's the Rutgers uh, School of Arts and Sciences uh, uh, little blurb for for the course. And I think a fun fact is I really like taking students into the field. And so here's four different field pictures. On the top left is drilling in the Chesapeake crater. You might not know this, but Chesapeake Bay is a remnants of the seventh largest recorded impact on Earth uh, that formed the crater in the Chesapeake Bay. And we drilled a one mile deep core hole into the Chesapeake Bay. This is showing the students. This is Drew Culpez as a student at the time. Uh, these are the cores that we laid out. I like going into the field. Uh, this next week, I'm supposed to be going, I am not, but I'm supposed to be going and taking my class field trip to the Buck Cliffs. We've postponed that for obvious reasons. And this is showing you a class trip uh, in 2010. I like taking my undergraduate classes out. This particular person is my son, Rob Miller, on a class field trip to beautiful downtown Buttsville, New Jersey. Uh, it's some great outcrops in Buttsville, uh, not too far from Rutgers. And I mentioned about the Alvin. So this is setting the Alvin up for a dive offshore of New Jersey uh, to look at outcrops on the continental slope. So my studies 
have mainly been on sea level. I look at sea level by drilling New Jersey's onshore. So this is the coastal plain. So you, may, many of you are living here in the Newark Basin. New Brunswick is uh, here. Uh, Princeton is down here. Uh, but there's a fall line here. And to the south of the fall line is the coastal plain. And the green are Cretaceous strata and the yellow or Cenozoic strata. And these record sea level changes over the past 100 million years that we've drilled onshore. This is Bass River State Park. We've drilled out on the continental shelf. This goofy looking rig is, is called a lift boat. It lifts itself out of the water and we drilled in 2009 to get some of the records I'll show you. And this is the Joides Resolution. And the Joides Resolution drilled all over the world, uh, collecting cores that we study for sea level. In the deep sea, far at the bottom of the oceans, we can monitor changes in ice volume using a geochemical tracer in our uh, group called the Foraminifera, and I'll show you that in a minute. So let's get to the science. Sea level rise. Sea level is now rising because of global warming. That's not an interpretation, that's in a fact. Warming causes the oceans to expand. And if you've ever put a tea kettle on the stove and you filled it right to the top and you turn it on, you will know right away that it will be boiling over and, uh, because of the expansion of the water as you heat it. And that will cause about one foot of rise in the 21st century. We also have the big effect will be the melting of ice sheets on land. And that's our big unknown. And that's going to cause sea level to rise between one and five feet in the 21st century. And again, this figure shows, I said 66 meters, but it's about four. Uh, no, that's not correct. It's not 400 feet. It is uh, about 200 feet of rise uh, if you melted all the ice sheets. For, like NASA, I can't convert meters to feet correctly. So how do you study sea level? Very simply, you could go down to the Jersey Shore and stick a pipe in the ground, we call a core, and pull it up. And the first thing you would want to do is determine the age of the sediments or date them. Now, we don't have many clocks. We can use radiocarbon for about 50,000 years, but our records are going to go way back in time. So we use often fossils as a proxy. This is a micro a fossil called uh, a foraminifera called Hankanina from the Eocene. So we see this guy, we know that we are in 34 million year old or older strata. The second thing we have to do is determine changes in water depth. We can use, these are benthic foraminifera. Uh, they live on the bottom and they are sensitive to the environmental conditions, including depth. So we can reconstruct these changes through time. But sea level is not like a bathtub. When we add water by melting an ice sheet or expand water by warming it up, the water, depending on the situation, there'll be more of a rise in one place than another. And on the bottom here, the blue areas are seeing much faster of a sea level rise than the red areas. And I'll take you through this later why this is true. But you could think of it as when we change the water in the ocean, it's kind of like this woman walking across cover of a swimming pool. She's putting weight down on the cover and is deforming the cover. And depending upon where you are in a pool, sea level is rising or falling. So this is one of the things we have to do to determine past sea level change. On last Friday, we had this figure appear in Science Advances what it is is showing you the past 66 million years. This is a time scale. Geologists use these terms like Paleocene, Eocene, Oligocene, Miocene, and then a Pleistocene here, Pliocene. Uh, and this is the sea level curve that we published. And this is showing you in both in meters and in feet. So in the most recent past, sea level was at one of its lowest low stands. 400 feet below present. We're going to take you through sea level change since the time of the dinosaurs and what controls it. We determined this record using chemical records determined from, this is a benthic foraminifera, and this is uh, called Sibisodoides. It lives on the bottom. 
and it makes its test uh, it makes its test out of calcium carbonate. And if we drop acid onto the test, it makes uh, cal uh, carbon dioxide, which we can measure various isotopic ratios in this uh, foram, which is a proxy for basically ice volume. So this is telling you that the ice sheets were essentially absent here, got larger, smaller, larger, smaller, larger, smaller, larger, smaller. And so now if we go back and look at this record, if we go back to the age of the dinosaurs, from about 70 million to 100 million in the Cretaceous, the world was mostly ice free. This is an illustration that came out earlier this year for what Antarctica would have looked like about 90 to 93 million years ago. Uh, Antarctica was still at the pole, and yet it was quite warm. And that also happened again in the Eocene when we had an, a largely ice free world. The Eocene, particularly from an interval of about 48 million to about 55 million, was ice free. Okay. Carbon dioxide in the atmosphere started to decrease around 50 million years ago. And as carbon dioxide decreased, ice began to build up on the Antarctic continent. Until 34 million years ago, we went into basically a very large ice sheet in Antarctica. We call this the ice house world. And ice grew and decay, decayed on this ice house world many times. As I said, it grew here to sea level below uh, 50 meters or, or over 150 feet below present. Then, then some of the ice melted and grew again, grew again, uh, melted, grew again. As Lauren picked up this graphic from uh, NASA, this is one of the um, uh, glaciers that we, uh, from earlier in the 20th century, now you see it, now you don't. This is from Patagonia. This is showing a determination of an ice sheet into a glacial lake. I had the pleasure of seeing very similar pictures live and in person in Iceland this past summer. I was in a boat out here, and one of these uh, walls of ice collapse called calving event. And we were right there at the sea. It's pretty exciting. So ice continued mostly in Antarctica until about 2.5 million years ago. And that's when we entered the so-called ice ages. And this is the extent of ice roughly 20,000 years ago. Ice came down to the Woodbridge Center Mall where the covered Scotch Plains came down into Nebraska. Okay, this ice sheet was uh, over a kilometer thick uh, in New York City. So it was quite high. Um, and here it was over, it was miles thick uh, over Hudson, what's now Hudson Bay. And this happened about 2.5 million years ago. This is showing you now going to a different time scale now, a shorter time scale. This is the last 140,000 years. And this is one of these, the sea level record showing you that there's a low stand of sea level here at about 140,000 years a low stand of sea level about 20,000 years ago. This is the last glacial maximum here. These ice ages were controlled by minor variations in the Earth's orbit, which we call Milankovitch cycles. And this is very minor changes in the tilt of the Earth and the position of the Earth when it makes its closest approach to the sun. So today, actually, the Earth makes its closest approach to the sun in early January. So it's not, winter doesn't occur because we make our closest approach to the sun, but because at that time, instead of being tilted toward the sun in the orbit as we go around, we're actually tilted away. And these minor variations in the Earth's orbit determine how much sunlight come in, comes in. We call that insulation. And when summer insulation is at its minimum, we get an ice age because it allows the ice to hang out through the summer. And so these ice ages are paced by 
these minor variations in the Earth's orbit. The ice ages are punctuated by what we call interglacials. There was an interglacial 125,000 years ago. We are in an interglacial today. Our interglacial began about 11,000 years ago. We call it the Holocene or the recent. The last major interglacial was about 125,000 years ago. What's kind of interesting is, is that sea level during that last interglacial was about seven meters, that is about 24 feet, 25 feet higher than present. How do we know that? Let's go down to Exuma Key in the Bahamas. And there in Exuma, you can see that this notch is about seven meters above present. This is measuring where sea level was 20, 125,000 years ago. How do we know that? We are able to do radiometric dates on these corals that lived here. The corals are like fossil sunshine. And by dating them with methods like uranium, thorium dating, we know precisely what the age as, of, of this bench is. What's important about this is that the last interglacial was only a little bit warmer than today, okay? Actually, the temperature is probably about the same as it is in 2020. It was probably about a degree centigrade or 1.8 degrees Fahrenheit warmer than it was in 1850. So it was just a little bit warmer. What it's telling us is that the Earth's natural uh, tendency would be to have sea level about seven meters above present. So sea level uh, rose. This is uh, the ice sheet I showed you earlier. We call it the Laurentide ice sheet. It reached its peak at around 20,000, 20 to, 20 to 27,000 years ago, and it melted away. The, on the right, we can see the carbon dioxide record. Most of these ice ages were paced by Milankovitch. The carbon dioxide plays a role by modulating and in amplifying these major deglaciations. So the major deglaciation that we see over the past 20,000 years is shown by this record. This is again showing you 120,000, sorry, 20,000 years ago, sea melt level was 120 meters below present. So these are mastodon fossils. Okay, they're same, similar to what we see in the uh, Geology Museum at Rutgers. And they're found out here. This is about the, uh, 100 and, the 200 meter uh, contour. This is, I believe, 100, 100 meter contour. This area was all exposed and Macedons and Native Americans roamed this area 20,000 years ago. Sea level rose in two major steps. First one is called Meltwater Pulse 1A. The second one was called Meltwater Pulse 1B. Meltwater Pulse 1A is about 14,000 years ago. Meltwater Pulse 1B is about 12,000 years ago. And the rates were quite high, 1.5 feet per year. And that's what, this is a little video showing you the day after tomorrow. Just, uh, it's a great exaggeration in this video, uh, but you probably wouldn't need an arc with 1.5 feet per year. But certainly the flood legends of uh, existing in so many uh, parts of Earth, of human history, probably came from a very similar rates of rise in the Black Sea about 5,000 years ago, as the Black Sea connected to the main ocean. But certainly this was quite, quite high by human standards. Um, to see how this works, there's an animation here that shows you starting out with 20,000 years ago. We can see the ice age started to melt back, then grew again a little bit, and then really started to melt again. So this period would be right about here. And then as we get into the last 10,000 years, right here, we can see sea level began to slow because we had melted much of the Laurentide ice sheet and really slowed further of from between 5,000 and 2,000 years. 
and is slowing between five and 2,000 years. About 2,000 years ago, it slowed so much that our barriers formed. So this is Long Beach Island. This is Holgate. This is the um, uh, basically Beach Haven here, in Holgate, uh, and, and looking north to Ship Bottom. We'll be going to Ship Bottom in a few minutes. One of the big questions is, is the sea level rise we see today part of a natural cycle? And the answer is no. Sea level has neither been rising nor falling since essentially during the common era. We go back to the time of Julius Caesar, we go back to the time of Christ. There were no, really no major changes in sea level. Most of the ice sheet had melted. The so-called common era of the past 2,000 years, sea level was stable until the beginning of the 20th century. And then we started seeing a major rise. In the 20th century, sea level rose at about a rate of seven inches in the century. Since about 1993, though, this rate has increased. So this is shown that rate from tide gauge data. So tide gauge, some places are sinking faster. And so you see a faster rate of rise like Galveston or even New York. Key West is about a global average. Some places like Alaska are actually falling. If you average and get data and you take out these, these effects, uh, we'll see in a minute, you get this global change in sea level of about seven inches per century, which is accelerated to today at being about a foot per century. We're also sinking regionally. I showed a version of this figure before. This is showing you what sea level is doing all over the planet at the present time. So it is rising much faster here you know, in New Jersey and New York area than it is other, many other places. And one of the reasons why is you can think this area was covered by an ice sheet and it was pushed down or depressed. And as you released that mass, as you melted the ice, we basically, like on a seesaw, as the ice sheet disappeared, what happens when you take this uh, big guy off of this uh, seesaw? This goes up and this goes down. We go down. We call that glacial isostatic adjustment. So the coastal plain is sinking even faster than New York, Philadelphia, Baltimore. So here's New York, Philadelphia, and Baltimore, which have a sea level rise of about a foot a century. If we go to Atlantic City, it's about 16 inches per century. Or if we go to Newport News, uh, Virginia Beach, it's about 18 inches per century. And the reason why is these areas in the coastal plain are compacting. Okay. The compaction, I like this little video. We've all taken a bucket of sand from by the beach and we walk across the beach and see water appear at the top of the bucket. That's what's happening here. These sediments are just been picked up and see water in, and they're compacting. And so when we would draw groundwater from Atlantic City, when we would draw groundwater from Sandy Hook, this ground compacts and we sink even faster. So we need to look toward the future now. If we take, we know very well what, how much sea level will rise due to the effect of temperature, just expanding a sea water. We don't know very well how much it will react to the ice sheets. And the best estimate with the accelerations that we see in various estimates is that we will be looking at about 3.5 feet of rise by 2100 at the Jersey Shore. A little bit less, about a half a foot less, at Philadelphia, New York, and Baltimore because they're sitting on bedrock and they don't have this compaction effect. So three, three and a half feet of rise by the end of the century. Why does this matter? Well, let's go back to Long Beach Island. So this is the boulevard here, up here is ship bottom. We can see that sea level ba barrier islands, such as Long Beach Island, they are not harmed by sea level rise, but they move because of sea level rise. And this part of the barrier has moved about 400 meters. Uh, historically, I used to come down here with my kids when they were little, 
and just walk out into the beach, which was out here. It's moved landward, okay? This moving landward is a natural response of these barrier islands. And that's not a bad thing unless you build a house. So then what happens is the houses that are here will be destroyed. And sea level rise is going to make this worse. Let's take this example from Ship Bottom. Ship Bottom, New Jersey is just up the, the uh, boulevard, so right about here is Ship Bottom. Uh, I like to say that sea level is like politics. It's all local. It's the thing that affects you is where the water level is, which means it's a combination of global sea level rise from temperature and ice volume, but also the sinking of the area uh, from various effects. So this is a picture that I took flying over ship bottom. This is 28th Street, uh, right after the barrier, uh, barrier island was nourished, okay, and the beach widened. This is the same area right after Sandy. So my friend's house is actually right there. And you can see this is from the front page of the Philadelphia Inquirer. This is what sea level is going to be like in this region uh, by about 2050. So 2050, this will almost be a yearly occurrence to have this kind of flooding. And this is what's going to be flooded by the year 2100 with a three foot uh, sea level rise. We'll be facing a fundamentally different New Jersey shore. So to bring us to an end, with current emissions, we will double carbon dioxide in the atmosphere in this century to over 580 ppm. Global temperatures will rise by about three to eight degrees Fahrenheit. So even if we drastically reduce CO2, we're gonna see much greater than a two degree Fahrenheit rise. How much sea level rise will depend mostly on how fast large ice sheets melt. Our best estimate's about three feet uh, by the end of the century. And that's kind of a conservative estimate. Scientists are measuring and modeling ice sheets. And some say it could be double this rate. So if I tell you three feet uh, and you really want to engineer for the end of the century, you probably should plan on double that. So with that, it's time for questions. Okay, so now I have to figure out how to do the questions. Uh, Two, two, two. Okay, so I have to unshare. Now I can see the questions. I have Google Docs and it is open. So you all can see me. So let's we'll start out with Rhea's mom. What does it look like for the future of the relationship between sea level and hurricanes and monsoons? Temperatures going up mean that you intensify what we call the hydrologic cycle. Just think about more evaporation because it's warmer. When you have more evaporation, it's got to balance, so you have to have more precipitation. So you actually get both periods of more drought, drier areas, and wetter areas. And so I always like to put this very simply, in a warmer world, the rich in water get richer, it gets wetter in wet areas, and the poor, the dry areas, get poorer or drier. Uh, so in terms of storm intensity, it's uncomfortable clear whether or not we will have more frequent storms. But we can say, especially with respect to tropical storms like hurricanes and uh, other tropical storms, um, that warmer waters will feed stronger storms. And we've seen that before with Katrina and other storms. Storms are sea level rises, very fast sea level rises. Okay? What happened with Sandy is 
Uh, we had a sea level rise of basically 13 feet in New York City. Okay, and we saw the devastating effects. So there will be more of those effects in the future. In terms of the monsoons, which are the seasonally You're back. <laughs> yeah, I'm back. Okay. So, um, that's a funny, it's the first time I've ever lost, uh, lost internet, but there was no power failure, I don't think. All right. Uh, I had to find the questions again. They suddenly disappeared. Um, I uh, will put it in the chat. Rhea, can you put it in the chat again? Yeah. So the, I was answering a very good question. And the question was, um, why did I become a geologist? So I was born in the so-called Sputnik era, uh, where everybody wanted, I wanted to be an astronaut when I grew up, like everybody did as we went to the moon. But then I suddenly converted when I was about five years old to say I wanted to be an oceanographer and everybody wanted to be Jacques Cousteau. And if you want to be an oceanographer, my advice is to go and major in a basic science. And I was told that chemistry, physics, geology, or biology. And I didn't know much about geology, but when I got to Rutgers, I decided to try geology and it was great. And then I made the full circle of getting my PhD in oceanography. And I am a marine geologist and study sea level. Uh, what is the response of these findings by the shore towns? I've given this talk many times, uh, two times in Bayhead, Margate, uh, Long Beach Island Foundation, uh, many, many different towns. Uh, mom, at the uh, Ocean County Library to 300 people. Uh, People have to realize that living at the Jersey Shore, you're always constantly fighting against nature. And sometimes nature is going to win. We saw that by the huge win nature had that they called Sandy. Uh, it doesn't mean that you can't live at the shore, uh, but there are risks involved. I had a shore house, in fact, taught a course it became my signature class called Should I Sell My Shore House? And I did sell my shore house. And the people who bought it looked up my course and said, wow, why should we buy your house? I said, well, you live on the block that I live on right now. You know what you have to do. I'm selling because it's not meaningful for me to go through this now that my kids are grown to have this house because it's a tremendous amount of work to maintain a house at the shore. Um, long term, we have to think about our kids and our grandkids. My grandkids will not be able to probably inherit that shore house. Uh, it will, we can continue to fight back and raise the streets and do all kinds of things, but this was on the bay side of, from Long Beach Island uh, in a place called Waretown, and it becomes very risky to have a shore house. But I wouldn't rush out and sell your shore real estate. Um, you need to be aware of the problem. though. So let's go to Mary from Scotch Plains, who has a number of questions. The sea level rise affects salinity? Yes. So 20,000 years ago, when we st stored all that fresh water in ice, the oceans went from an average salinity of 35 parts per thousand, that's 3.5% salt, to 3.6% salt. Not enough to really make a difference on organisms. Uh, the oceans have some kind of equilibrium with respect to salinity. The oceans have been in balance with what comes in from weathering to what is being deposited on a scale of 100 million years. So it's a very long time balance between the two. We call that steady state in chemistry. How does sea level rise affect estuaries? Estuaries only exist because of sea level rise. Estuaries are flooded river valleys. Uh, how do you flood or fjords? How do you flood a valley? Uh, well, you raise sea level. 
So estuaries are particularly susceptible to sea level rise. In Philadelphia, for example, uh, they get their water supply from the Delaware River, but the salt tongue that comes up the Delaware estuary uh, is moving further and further up as sea level is rising. So they will have to move their intakes for fresh water. Uh, will sea level carve new features going up the rivers with tides? Somewhat, yes, uh, within the tidal range. So probably not in our lifetimes. The fall line at Trenton, uh, you will see more flooding uh, on the uh, banks of the Delaware, uh, particularly the area of southern New Jersey and Cumberland County, the so-called West Coast of New Jersey, uh, which is on Delaware Bay. That area is heavily eroding, um, but the falls at Trenton aren't very substantial falls, but they're enough to prevent that salinity front from moving north of, of uh, Trenton. Well, the heights of the tide change, uh, not much, but in certain areas they may change a bit. Uh, Chesapeake Bay is going to be affected as just like any estuary. Um, let's see, will more water freeze at the edges because it'll be spread out longer? Uh, maybe. Uh, the area effect, one way to look at it with a one meter, three foot rise in sea level in New Jersey, we will lose about 3% of the area of the state, mostly marshland. Um, so those are areas that will be covered with water that weren't, okay? So yes, they will potentially be somewhat frozen. We already talked about rain cycles. They're not so much related to the seas as they are to warmer temperatures. And the continental shelves uh, will not change much. Uh, most of the effect is going to be on the near shore uh, region. So I think those are the major questions. Chris Rowan wants to know, uh, what can non-scientists do to help slow climate change? Well, that's a very good question. Uh, moving toward a renewable economy is good for many reasons. Um, we went fully solar, all my electricity is produced by solar, um, you know, driving an electric car. Uh, if we, we've seen that we can begin to slow down the effects uh, through some fairly minor, not minor, but uh, conservation. Just as an example of my own house, uh, we ended up saving about a third of our electric bill just by doing things of replacing LED you know, bulbs with LEDs, unplugging vampires, re replacing old air conditioners and old refrigerators, and going to more high efficiency. Mm -hmm. A third savings on electricity. Uh, same thing we, with, with um, driving. I don't want to be political here, but the original plan in the Clinton administration was to make the average fleet economy, um, so-called CAFE standards, uh, go from 25 uh, miles per gallon to 35 miles per gallon. And that bill was had bipartisan support and it would have been passed, uh, except that basically Detroit sent lobbyists and the bill was defeated. If that bill had been passed in 1996, we would have had a corporate fleet economy, uh, economy of 35 miles per gallon by the year 2020. We would have saved the, something like on the order 10% of the energy in the United States. That's equivalent to what full build out of wind would be. And the Obama administration put those standards back in and of course, the current administration has taken those standards back off. And the reason why government can be very important here 
because it's not going to be done by by industry per se. It needs some government guidance to, to ensure that this happens. And so uh, passing this law, which should have been passed in 1996, well, 1996, the, the, where an average car cost about $13,000, they said, do you realize by the time this law was pa uh, implemented and, and we're at 35, a car is going to cost $20,000? A car costs $20,000 anyway. So over time, these small incremental changes mandated by law do not cost as much as what they're purported to cost. So again, making changes in our energy infrastructure. Some of these things are happening naturally. The move from coal to natural gas by economic factors. No, nothing was done to encourage natural gas, um, but natural gas is twice and uh, has half of the emissions of, of coal. Uh, that move meant that the United States met its Kyoto Protocol targets, even though we never signed the Kyoto Protocols. So there's a lot that we can do, uh, but it is a global problem. And so no one person can solve this problem. So other questions? Are you there? I'm here, yes. Okay. I'm <laughs> <laughs> Had to unmute myself. Yes. Uh, no question. Okay, go ahead. Uh, how high will sea level be if half of the ocean froze? That's from Gabe O'Brien. Well, you could never, I don't understand, I see how you could freeze half of the ocean, but you could do the calculation that ice is, has a density of, well, you all know that 90% uh, of an iceberg is below water, so its density is 0.913, I think. So it's 91%. Uh, so if you froze half of the oceans, the mean depth of the oceans is four kilometers, okay? So if you froze two kilometers of ocean, sea level would rise by uh, 200 meters. Um, Earth has a long history of climate change going back to, as I showed you, an uh, ice-free world. If we went back 650 million years to a snowball Earth, okay, uh, there is some discussion that sea level could have fallen by as much of a kilometer as all of the continents were covered with ice from equator to pole. Uh, so that is about the closest that we have seen in Earth's experiment with climate. But even there, the ice thickness is modeled to be only on the order of hundreds of meters, not 2,000 meters. So we'd have to go to another planet that would have uh, oceans with ice that are about two kilometers. I'm not a planetary geologist, but I seem to remember that Enceladus, one of the moons of Saturn, probably has the kind of world that you've asked about. There's another one from Masha. Uh, what areas in the world experience uh, the highest sea level rise now? So two of the highest areas are in the Gulf Coast, in particular the Mississippi Delta, and the other one is in Bangladesh, in uh, the, the Delta uh, uh, there. So these river deltas bring a tremendous amount of sediment down, and they have mass that helps load the crust. Um, but the predominant effect from studies, particularly in Mississippi Delta region, 
New Orleans south to the, to the what's called the Plaquemines Delta, the Mississippi, Plaquemines Parish, which is Plaquemines County, we would call it. The predominant effect appears to be the fact that these very young sediments that came down the river have a tremendous amount of organic matter. And that organic matter, once it's buried, decays and collapses. Um, you could think about that if you were burying something in your backyard that had like tree roots and things like that. That area will really compact a lot. And so just to give you a scale, unfortunately, this is in millimeters per year and I can't convert my head easily. Global sea levels rising at three millimeters per year in 2020. In New Orleans, the whole region around the city of New Orleans is uh, subsiding at about 10 millimeters per year. And in the Plaquemines Delta, out on uh, in, in, in where it builds in the Gulf of Mexico, we're seeing about 14 millimeters per year. In the Delta in Bangladesh, where 22 million people live, there are very mm -hmm. similar rates on the order of 14, so that's 1.4 centimeters per year, okay? So three quarters of an inch per year of sea level rise. And those are some of the highest areas of sea level rise. In some places, like in Alaska and in Hudson Bay and in Sweden, sea level is actually falling because those regions are popping up. It is that seesaw effect. So the range is from areas, there are literally Viking docks that are hundreds of feet up, that have been uplifted since the time of the Vikings. So that gives you kind of a range from some of the highest rates of substance in these delta regions, to regions where it's actually sea level is falling. Okay, great. I think that is all the questions for now. Um, so thank you, Ken, for presenting on sea level. Um, I want to remind everyone to tune in on Thursday at uh, 11 a.m. Eastern Standard Time to see Dr. Lynn Trabuccino from the Rutgers Institute of Earth, Ocean, and Atmospheric Sciences. She's going to be talking about the atmosphere. So thank you again for joining us today. And we'll see you later this week. Thanks, Ken. <laughs> Sorry about the dropout. Oh, it happens. It's okay. <laughs> okay.